Now for today's program. Brad Meltzer is the number one New York Times bestselling author of The Lightning Rod and 12 other bestselling thrillers. He also writes nonfiction books like The Nazi Conspiracy about a secret plot to kill FDR, Stalin, and Winston Churchill at the height of World War II. His kids' book series, Ordinary People Changing the World, inspired the Emmy-nominated television show on PBS Kids, Xavier Riddle, Riddle and the Secret Museum. His advice books include Heroes for My Son and Heroes for My Daughter. Brad won the prestigious Eisner Award for his comic book, Justice League of America. And The Hollywood Reporter put Brad on the list of Hollywood's 25 most powerful authors. Brad is also the host of Brad Meltzer's Lost History and Decoded, both on the History Channel, and is responsible for helping find the missing 9-11 flag that the firefighters raised at Ground Zero. In addition to his books and TV shows, Brad was recruited by the Department of Homeland Security to brainstorm different ways the terrorists might attack the U.S. Joining Brad today is Moment contributor Dan Raviv. Dan is the author of books about Israeli espionage and diplomacy, including Spies Against Armageddon and Every Spy a Prince, as well as Comic Wars, an account of how Marvel Comics went bankrupt but was turned into a movie powerhouse by two Israeli Americans. Dan was a CBS News correspondent in Israel, Europe, and Washington for 40 years, and then senior DC correspondent for Israel's I-24 News. Please welcome Brad Meltzer and Dan Raviv. Suzanne, thank you so very much. I think everyone who's watching is going to enjoy the coming hour with Brad Meltzer. It's always a pleasure to see him. Um, and I hope that we're seeing each other just fine on Zoom. No technological difficulties. Uh, Brad, how are you today? I'm good. I'm glad to be here. Uh, there you are. There you are in the box in your, in your uh, writing and producing haven, I assume, because as we heard from Suzanne, uh, you are a man of books and comic books. And even when it comes to books for kids, for adults, and then there's television. And so you have your fingers in so many pies. Um, you, know, you yourself were telling me, because I really wanted to talk about the book that's over your right shoulder right now, the new novel, The Lightning Rod, and we'll also talk about the other books and projects. Yeah, well done, Brad. Um, but but I, I, I have to note that your first novel, your first thriller from 25 years ago had to do with the Supreme Court and a ruling being leaked. What? That's what's in the news right now. So you're obviously a genius. You came up with that 25 years ago. The title of that book was The Tenth Justice. Um, I assume you've been surprised when you started getting calls. I assume they started coming on Tuesday morning or messages telling, you know, asking you your opinion about the latest leak. I mean, I mean how, does that, how does that work? Yeah, no, this is, uh, I think I finally, after all these years, been able to prove I'm a time traveler. And, uh, but the plot of the 10th justice 25 years ago when I was a kid in Washington DC was about a Supreme Court clerk who leaks a decision before it's announced. And uh, obviously I could have never predicted 25 years later I would see it happen. Yeah, people, the one thing people are getting wrong today it is not the first time it has ever happened. It happened once before there was a scandal many, many years ago at which point when that was announced I said, my plot has been proven, I'm done. And I was very happy against any reviewer who said that it was unrealistic. But uh, sadly, it is not unrealistic at all. We'll find out if it's a clerk or if it's someone from the court. But the one thing you know is um, the opening line of the 10th justice, my sister wrote me this one. It, it said, Ben Addison was sweating like a pig and it wasn't supposed to be that way. And my sister wrote me this morning and said, that clerk is sweating right now like a pig. And it wasn't supposed to be that way. So whoever it is inside there, whether it was a clerk or an employee, uh, they have a problem on their hands right now. Yeah, that sentence of yours would work. Well, I've been mean, thinking about uh, the latest book, The Lightning Rod, and uh, it, it's a sequel, isn't it, to The Escape Artist? And, and it features two characters, Zig and, and Nola. And uh, how many years between those books? About four? Yeah, four years. Um, you know, I, listen, God bless the people who can write a book every year. If I wrote a book every year, they would be garbage. And there are people who do it great, but I can't. I, as you know, I love the research. I love diving into things and it takes me a while. And sometimes I dive into, just to kind of set it up for you, the setup for the lightning rod is very simple. I always start with my own fears. So the lightning rod opens with one of my great fears. A character hands his car keys over to a valet at a fancy restaurant. The valet takes the car keys, but instead of parking the car, he gets in the car 
and he hits the GPS on the steering wheel, the little magic button and says those words, go home. And now he plots a route to the man's house. The valet has the man's car keys. And of course, now he's got his house keys that are on there too, because he's going to rob him. This is a robbery. But as he breaks into the man's house, the valet sees that there's someone already there waiting for him with a gun, because this isn't a robbery at all. It's a trap. And when the body goes to our hero, Zig, who you just mentioned, Zig sees something on the body that no one was ever supposed to find. And it leads to one of the government's most closely guarded secrets. And I just ruined chapter one of the lightning rod for you, but that's the prologue. Uh, I saved you three pages of reading, but that's where it opens with. And obviously it takes me, you know, that's the part I can easily make up. But when I delve into the real history and the real stuff and the real research, uh, obviously that takes me years of time to kind of go through and, and ferret out interesting information. And tell me something about Nola, because sometimes people are skeptical about a man, however clever like Brad Meltzer, inventing a female lead character. So talk about Nola. Yeah, so she came from, I was uh, probably now seven years ago, I was in a, um, at Fort Belvoir in Virginia. They have this giant warehouse full of art. I'm like, why does the US Army have all this art? Paintings, beautiful paintings, ornate paintings. And this is true, is since World War I, the US government, the US Army has had a painter on staff who paints disasters as they happen, whether it's storming the beaches of Normandy, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's 9-11. And I said, you're telling me that everyone else is racing in with guns blazing, and you've got someone who's racing in with nothing but paintbrushes in their pockets. That guy sounds crazy. I want to meet him. I, wanna, I really want to meet him. And they said, you mean her. You want to meet her. And right there, Nola, our character was born when I realized, you know, as you said, I, I'm not stupid enough to try and invent completely from whole cloth, a, a, a female that I would never understand. Instead, I went and met someone who is really nothing like the character I created, but she had this background and this incredible job that I could never make up. And it's based on the real world. And, and Zig has this philosophy as the male hero of the book, that the world becomes a better place when you put some kindness in it. It's a beautiful idea. It's a very naive idea, but it's an idea worth fighting for. And Nola has a belief that if you want the world to make sense, you grab it by the throat and you force it to make sense. Mm -hmm. And I know that the book will always look like, oh, I take these two characters and I give them a murder plot and then they solve it. But what you're really seeing is me. Um, they're my philosophies about life. I firmly believe that if you wanna make the world a better place, you gotta put kindness in the world. And I also believe that when you see injustice, you fight like nobody's ever fought before. And I think all you're reading as you read The Lightning Rod is just me trying to figure out which of the two are right. And of course, they're both right in their own ways. And just a reminder, the first novel featuring Zig and Nola uh, was titled The Escape Artist. And so the new one is The Lightning Rod. But as soon as you said that you believe in, in having as much kindness as possible in the world, it made me think about some of your kids' books. I'm holding a sort of small edition of the one about Abraham Lincoln, but look at the title, I Am Kind. So what you wanted to emphasize to a really little kid as his or her parent is reading this book to them is that little Abe Lincoln, you know, was a very kind person. And in effect, that's what got him ahead. <laughs> and even when he's tiny, he's wearing a stovepipe hat um, and a beard. Yeah, even his, yeah that's right, <laughs> and a beard. So, but you I mean, know, I mean and but, but, but that's the perfect, right? But, that, but there I am, right? That is... There is a side of me that firmly believes that you have to put that kindness out there. I will write books dedicated to it and for your children and entertain them because I want to give my kids better heroes to look up to. I will also on that same day go back to my adult thrillers and murder people. So there's my Zig and there's my Nola. But, you know, I, I really think that the most authentic story you can ever tell, Dan, is your own story. And that's all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to tell my own story. Obviously, I pepper it with real research. I mean, I've taken readers in the tunnels below the White House. I've done the secret labyrinth below the Capitol, the security of the Supreme Court. And this book I found out, and this is true, that the US government has about a dozen secret warehouses hidden all across the country that they use to deal with terrorist bioterror attacks, whether it's anthrax or whether it's smallpox. And it means if there's an attack in New York or in California, Texas, Iowa, DC, anywhere in between, that the government will have antidotes shipped to the city within a few hours to deal with the disaster. And I said to them, wait, you're telling me that the government has secret warehouses hidden all across the country. No one can go inside. No one knows what's in there. I want to know what's in there. And so as you're reading the end of the lightning rod 
and you get to that ending where the you know the killer is revealed in one of these warehouses, and that's where you find out who done it. It's a great big moment, but you'll see that what you see in that warehouse, I didn't make up. That's what's really inside there. And I love the fact that when you read the book, you get to learn something like that. Well, I, I've often wondered this, but actually I've never had a chance to ask you, were you a journalist at any point in your career? Or frankly, in your nonfiction writing and your history channel television hosting, maybe you consider yourself kind of a journalist even now. You know, it's funny. People ask me, I, I've never been a journalist. Um, I just like, I, I just think there's no more interesting story than the true story. And I know I'm someone who's writing novels as I say that, but I, I don't know. When I read a novel, I want to learn something. I want to feel that. And, and I know I can make it up. I can say that there are, there are secret tunnels that run below Disney World um, and they go all the way to the White House and you'd roll your eyes, <laughs> right? All right, because you know that's not true. But if I said to you, when you're in the White House, you're on the ground floor quarter on the big red carpet. You'll see two statues about midway down. And I want you to go into the door that's between those two statues. You're going to see all the chairs stacked up to the ceiling. That's where they store the chairs for the state dinners. On the back of that room, you'll see another open door. Go through it. You'll smell flowers in the air. That's where the White House flower shop is. And go down that long path that you'll see HVAC equipment will come in the ceiling. The ceiling will slope down a little bit. Now you're in the basement of the White House. And make a right-hand turn at the dead end. You'll see it a steel door, that's the entrance to the underground tunnels below the White House. That's the bomb shelter that exists where Dick Cheney went on 9-11. And suddenly, whatever lie I'm telling you seems really potently real. And you know that I didn't make that up. You know that's real. So I, I just love that part. It makes the books take longer. But I think that they're, that's the payoff of reading them. And, and you don't have to read and you, know, you, don't, you don't have to read The Escape Artist to enjoy The Lighting Rod. You can just pick it up. But obviously, to me, when you pick up the book, you should get a little more bang for your buck. Let's uh, catch up on the development of a career, if you don't mind. Last I checked, you're 52 years old. I think you're born in Brooklyn, right? But, Correct. But raised where? Where was most of your childhood? Uh, I was raised in Brooklyn. I, I stayed in Brooklyn until I was about to start high school. And then my dad lost his job and had what he called the do-over of life. He was going to start over from scratch, had $1,200 to his name, had no place to live, no money but the $1,200. And we moved down to Miami, Florida, which is where my grandmother and every other Jewish grandmother lived. And it was there, as he called the do-over of life, that my family started over. And luckily, Florida was better for my family than Brooklyn was. I, I mean, I loved Brooklyn growing up, but it kicked my family's butt. And it was one of those moments where we weren't just scared about, you know, oh, do we have enough money to do X, Y, or Z? But we, we worried about safety. You know, we had no place to live. And so Florida, I feel like I, I have almost two motherlands, right, of Brooklyn and Florida. It just depends if you want to be pre-puberty -pre or post-puberty. Now, I know for uh, the viewers of these Moment Magazine Zoominars who happen to be in the Washington, D.C. area, they'll want to know that you're, you're quite at home here, too. Uh, how did that happen? Yeah, so, yeah, so I went to school. Uh, I went to college in Michigan, went to law school at Columbia in New York. And then we moved to Washington, D.C. And that was where I really published my first book. Uh, the 10th Justice was obviously written when I was in Washington uh, and I was researching the Supreme Court and the book came out when I was there. In fact, your producer, Suzanne, we got to do a shout out for her. She actually was at my first, one of my first events 25 years ago. We used to go, I never tell the story, but I'll tell it in her honor. We used to, we had these little postcards made for the 10th Justice in Washington, D.C. And I used to live at Highland House West in Bethesda and one of the big high rises there. And, uh, and we, we would go on every floor where the, where the washing machines were because everyone had to do their laundry. And we, we would staple one of my postcards in the laundry room. And we thought, everyone's going to see this. This is going to be great. Mar Guerrilla marketing didn't exist. We were truly inventing it at that moment, just figuring that's going to be, people are going to be here stuck doing their laundry. They're going to see my book. And the best part is everyone who rolls their eyes as I say that story is Suzanne was one of the people who saw in her laundry room that postcard and read the book and came to our event there. So I love the fact that 25 years later, I travel wherever I go and it all comes back to where I lived in Washington, D.C., right in, in really in Maryland and Bethesda. And if I'm hearing you correctly, even though you went to Columbia Law School, where you probably could have had your pick of jobs as a lawyer, did you take a job as a lawyer? Uh, define the word practice, and I'll tell you if I practice law. Um, <laughs> the truth was, is I didn't, I, I was lucky enough. The first book I ever wrote, I wrote in law school. Um, I wrote right before I got to law school. I tried to, I got an agent in law school 
And my, fr- my first year, uh, I, I was obviously just so busy as a first year law student. I never could really write during the first year, but I, I started submitting it to agents and to publishers. And that first book got me 24 rejection letters. There were only 20 publishers at the time. I got 24 rejection letters. So people were writing me twice to make sure that I heard what they were saying. <laughs> but the week after I got my 23rd and 24th rejection letter is when I started what became the 10th justice. And I was living in DC at the time. And I wrote that book while I was in law school. And I was lucky enough that it sold during my second year of law school. I worked on finishing it during my third year of law school. And the book came out when I was living in DC. And that was really the the start of my career. I think, you know, all of us know that it takes one person to say yes sometimes. And our job is to find that one person. And I was lucky enough after I got my, my 24 rejection letters, I said, if they don't like that book, I'm going to write another. And if they don't like that, I'm going to write another. And the week after I got my 23rd and 24th rejection is when I started the 10th justice. And that was the first book. We found one person, one editor to say yes. And I got lucky and they published it. May I ask you for a little word of tribute? Because I noticed you you had to, well, you didn't have to. You put some sad news on Twitter um, that your literary agent recently passed away. And she made a huge difference in your life. Yeah, so Jill Neerum, I never have gotten to talk about her, so thank you for asking about her. Um, Jill Neerum is, is the agent who said yes to me when my first book, when I wrote it. And when I got my 23rd and 24th rejection letter, what she should have done is say, nice knowing you, kid. Um, I was you know, 24 years old at the time, and I'll take a tax write-off on those photocopies we made for you and have a nice life. And instead, she said to me, tell me about this book about the Supreme Court. I'm going to stick with you. I believe in you. And she changed my life. She changed my life by having faith in me as a kid. And she was just this incredible, amazing person who just had not just kind of an an abundance of enthusiasm, which is easy to have. And that can come off as naivete. But what Jill had was um, she had this ability to see the best version of you. And that was her magician power. And she could see your potential and, and make you believe that you had it. And when my first book was, you know, hadn't sold, she was like, I believe in you, let's keep going. And so I had the fuel to keep going. She refilled the car. And she'd been with me my entire life, my entire career. She just passed away about two weeks ago. Um, so we are still obviously mourning her here. And uh, I still, in fact, I was telling my wife today, I got to a scene and it was kind of stuck. And I was like, this is when I want to call it Jill. So it is one of the big losses in my life came this year. So we celebrated the 25th anniversary. The crazy part was I went and looked up the first article that the New York Times did. A, they did a profile on me when I started. And I remember I looked and it quoted Jill Neerum in there. And she was uh, a raging 57 years old. And I remember at the time thinking she is so old. So that, that, that completely hurt. But she appreciated how old I called her. You're only 52 now, buddy boy. Um, tell me about television. I, I think personally, I came across you first in one of those History Channel series. One of them has your name on it. See, oh yeah, Brad Meltzer's Lost History. And the other series I recall was Decoded. Uh, but who approached whom? How did television start? Yeah, so this was funny. The um, I'd written a book about called The Book of Fate about Thomas Jefferson and the secret codes he used to use, the Freemason codes he used to use when he was the pre- and, and, and about Freemason codes that were used um, throughout history. And uh, when that, a, was non, one of the heads that was not, that was nonfiction, a product of, no, history. that was fiction. It was, it was a fictional book, but I used the uh-huh. real details of, of the codes that Thomas Jefferson used and real research into Freemasonry. I just was interested in Freemasonry at the time and thought, well, I'm going to make that part of the book. So the head, again, perfect example, the head of the history channel was reading my fictional book, saw the real research on it and said, I love what you did here. You have five more of those stories. And I was like, yeah. And so he said to me, we, you know, and the truth was he wanted to do, they wanted to do a ripoff of Da Vinci Code. That's what they wanted, right? Mm-hmm. It, the Masons seemed like it was cool. They're like, we want to do the Freemason. I'm like, don't do that. Then you're just ripping off, off the Da Vinci Code. I said, why don't you instead do this? Why don't you instead look at this story? That when the first cornerstone of the White House was first put down when they built the White House, within 24 hours, it was laid down in a, in a secret Freemason ceremony. Within 24 hours, the first cornerstone of the White House went missing. Nobody knows where it is. Let's see if we can figure out where it is. And they said, you got four more of those. And so I just said, I got it. Yeah. And so I basically came in and just pitched them all these historical ideas that I'd found in research for fiction, but I used in the real version of it. And, uh, and we built a show around all these kind of different mysteries through history that I had never been able to figure out. And suddenly I had this team of researchers who were helping me look at things that I used to 
do by myself in the novels. And, and they just kept putting me, I was supposed to just introduce it at the beginning. And then they kept putting more and more of me in the show. Uh, and my wife was just joking because she was like, you didn't even want to be on television. I'm like, I know, but that's the way it's going to be. And so suddenly we had a TV show, which is the most backwards way I've ever heard of anyone get it on television. But we just kind of stumbled into it. <laughs> Should I be asking her or you, were you a natural or also the History Channel provided producers who in effect were teaching you uh, how to walk and talk and, uh, and how to... Yeah, focus. no, they didn't give me any, I wish they gave me that. I could, I could use that today. I'd still use it. No, the truth was, here's the funny, the truth was, is it was it was like Seinfeld. It was like, you remember when, when George on Seinfeld does the opposite of everything he wants to do? He says he's going to do the opposite. And, and, and for my whole career, we've been chasing Hollywood and chasing Hollywood. And finally, I was like, you know what? I'm done chasing them. I'm just going to want to write my books. And I don't care. So I said, I don't even want to be in the show. And, and they, they got the reel and had a little bit of me at the very beginning of every episode introducing the show. And then they would say, yeah, we don't like this. We don't like this. We don't like this. But we need more Brad. And I was like, that's fine, but I don't want to be in the show. And then they would come back with the next. And they'd be like, nah, change this, change it for more. And suddenly my wife is like, y you're doing the George. You're doing the opposite of what you would usually do. And, that, and that's finally what wound up working for us. I can't, I can't explain it any better than that. And the script says Brad on camera, Brad, Brad on camera. I can imagine. I, I, wish they, yeah, I wish they gave me walking and talking lessons. I, I do think I could use them still. But, but I will say it was just, they, what happened was, is they were interviewing me about the White House. And they said, can you do a little tag about something about the White House? And I, and I did that bit about the secret tunnels. And they were like, oh he knows stuff. Let's get him talking on camera. And that's just what they let me do. Yeah, very nice. Now, what about comic books? I mean, first, I think we should mention that those wonderful books for children about heroes, and we'll speak about the one who's the book that's over your left shoulder in a moment. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I am Albert Einstein. I am Amelia Earhart. We spoke about Abraham Lincoln earlier. Um, the illustrator is Chris Eliopoulos, and he's from the world of comic books. So what does Brad Meltzer have to do with Marvel or DC Comics or, or both? Yeah, you know, when I wrote my first novel, The Tenth Justice, I made all the Supreme Court justices. I named them after characters in my favorite book of all time, The Watchmen, after Watchmen by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. And no one at the time caught it. It was like, I would go to every event and one person would wait at the end and be like, hey man, I'm like, yeah, and he's like, Osterman? Nice job. And they just, and, and nobody knew. It was pre-internet, pre-anything. No one, there were no Easter eggs. I just did it because I'm a comics nerd and I love putting it in there. And so the Supreme Court justices were named after the, the Watchmen. Um, and then every book I started hiding really deep cut references of comics in there. And again, no, it wasn't like Dick Grayson and Clark Kent. It was like, it was like Jay Garrick and the original Justice Society of America secret identities. Like you had to know Legion of Superhero home planets. I would make like obscure things in there. And finally, when my fourth book came out, um, at the time, Green Arrow was being written by Kevin Smith, the director, the famous director. And nobody was working in comics. If you weren't a comic writer, you didn't work in comics. Kevin was the first one through, and it was their number one superhero book. And Kevin announced that he was leaving. And at the very last uh, person in line at one of my events, my fourth novel was an editor for DC Comics, and he said, Kevin Smith is leaving Green Arrow. Would you like to write and take over the book? And I looked at him. I said, I've been waiting my whole life for someone to ask me that. I've just always been a comic book nerd. And he wait, said, wait, wait, Listen, Brad, we... that, that, Brad, that offer was not to just sort of guest write one, uh, one, one episode, one edition, one? He said, he said, take it over as long as you want to stay. I said, I, could, I, I can't stay long because I'm writing novels. But I said, I'll, I'll write a story arc. I'll write a whole arc. Wow. And they said, it, this is our number one book our superhero book at the time, I should say. And they said, if we take Kevin Smith off that book, everyone's going to say, you know, and we put a comic writer on there, they'll say, where's Kevin Smith? But if we take him away, if he leaves and we put a novelist on there that no one's ever heard of, everyone's going to go, what does DC Comics know giving their number one superhero book to an unknown? And they'll think we know something. So you'll either fail on a big stage or you'll succeed on a big stage, but take a shot. And I was like, I'll take a shot. So I, I started writing comics and then I got hired by DC, got hired by Marvel. And I got to write Justice League and Batman and Spider-Man and all these other characters. But it was solely built out of my love of comics that I've been hiding in my novels for years. Mm. And by the way, earlier in this conversation, you said you only get out a major book every four years because you want to do it right. And it takes a long time. All of that is true. 
but I think our viewers now know you're also busy with lots of other stuff in between. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know nothing takes as long though. As, I mean, listen, a, a, a 22 page comic, as hard as it is to do and pull off is, I mean, when you compare that to a 400 page novel where I, I have to do the painting and the writing, right? I mean, I can lean on all the artists in comics. That's the beautiful part. But I think that for me, I, I, someone said recently, and it was the first thing that rang true is that, you know, when you, when you, it's like a palate cleanser. And once you go to another project, whatever you're working on becomes far more interesting. So when I jump away from novels and I go do comics or I go do TV or I go do nonfiction or I go do the kids books, then novels are, are special again to me. And I really want to go back and do that novel. If I, if I had to write 20 novels in a row over 20 years, I'd, I'd be miserable right now. I, it would be like saying to me, hey, Dan, what's your favorite genre? That's the only genre you can watch for the rest of your life. I don't care what that genre is that you love. You're going to hate it if I make you eat just that. There's the cliche about Brad Meltzer. Variety is the spice of life. Now, when it comes to the kids' books, first, a quick connection with the comic book world. One of the upcoming ones in this series that in the upper left of the cover always says, um, ordinary people change the world. So these are heroes. You're you have Batman and Superman coming up too. They're not real. So you're sort of extending the series more than a little. I'm going to show you right now because we don't usually get to do it, but I'm going to show you. That's what I'm pulling up right now for you. So you yeah. get to see here's I am Superman. Wow. And then the next one after that is I am Batman. And we, yes, of course, we'll have I am Wonder Woman in there as well. We're working on. Um, and we wanted to do, as you said, this is going to be a little different title. It's called uh, Stories Change the World. Ah. And the idea of Stories Change the World is to give people and show kids um, the fictional characters that are amazing. And we not only show you the story of them as characters, but we spend the last pages instead of the timeline as we tell you the story of how they were created. So you see the two Jewish 17-year-old kids, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, who came up with the idea for Superman. They weren't popular. They weren't good looking. They were just two kids. Um, and they gave the world something to believe in. And two kids from Cleveland, teenagers, 17 year olds, came up with the character Superman. I don't think there's a better way to teach kids the power of their own imagination. So yes, we're doing Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman are the first in the series. Okay, over your left shoulder is Anne Frank. Of course, author of the incredible diary that was found after she was dead, you know, after the Holocaust. So that's a, that's a difficult subject I would think for kids. So what's the Anne Frank book like? How'd you approach it? Yeah, you know, listen, um, as I said, I, I wanted to give my kids better heroes in this world. Our kids are being fed garbage every day on the internet. As they roll through Instagram and swipe through all the different things they're swiping through, um, you know, we roll our eyes and say, oh, it's so bad because we do the same thing. We're all being fed garbage every day on the internet. And I just said, we can use these, this time to give our kids better people to look up to, not people who are Instagram famous or millionaire overpaid athletes or reality TV show stars, but some people that actually can teach them good values, um, perseverance and kindness and, and compassion. If you told me that when I went to my editor and said, you know what, I want to do a, a, a kid's book about the Holocaust, uh, she should have laughed me out of her office. She should have been like, there's no way we're letting you do that. And instead, to her credit, the amazing Lori Hornick said to me, I think it's a perfect time. We had seen that anti-Semitism had been obviously at, at the highest levels that since the ADL had been started tracking incidents of anti-Semitism, I saw a statistic at the time that said that millennials don't know basic facts about the Holocaust, much less that 6 million Jews had died in the Holocaust, not even counting everyone else who also died there. Um, we were, and I, and I wanted to teach my kids hope. So how do you teach hope? Um, and to me, there's no better way to teach hope than Anne Frank. And obviously it took so much more work than what our kids book take because we have to bring the Holocaust down to what are really four or five to about 12 years old. And that's a big range. Four and five is very different than 11 and 12, but that's who reads our books. It's these, this young group um, that reads our books. And we work with the, you know, obviously the National Holocaust Museum. We work with one of their experts who they gave us. We work with the Anne Frank Center to make sure we're doing it correctly, trying to figure out what's that right balance. We didn't, we never shy away from the hard issue. We don't just, we don't pretend the Holocaust didn't exist and she's some girl who loves a diary and then dreamed of hope and everything was great. We're like, no, we, we'll show you a concentration camp. We'll show it to you in an age appropriate way. We'll show in a way that kids digest it. I remember the day the book came out, when I Am Anne Frank came out, 
the first person I heard from was my sister who had my four, I forget if she was four or five year old niece at the time. And I thought, oh, here it comes. She goes, I just read it with her. And I said, and she's like, it, it worked. It totally worked. We, we then had an hour long conversation, age appropriate about the Holocaust. She wasn't scared and crying, but she was actually like proud to be, she said her reaction was I'm proud to be Jewish when she was done and she had, she got it. And, and I said, I love that you sound so confused that it actually worked. But I didn't know if it was gonna work or not. And Chris didn't know if it was gonna work, but we put in the book, um, you know, it was, we even wanted, we even changed the things we do that once she goes into the attic, you'll see the book is open and here's this black space that you'll see once she goes into the attic. But every scene, once she goes into the attic, the spaces get smaller and they start shrinking. And we wanted you to feel what it was like to be able to see that space get smaller and smaller and smaller. And I love the fact that Chris could show this space shrinking so kids could feel like it's different than every other book we've ever tried. I, I didn't know if it was gonna work. Uh, I Am Am Frank became one of the number one launches we've ever had because there were so many people who were worried exactly what I was worried about, which is that rise of anti-Semitism and how do you teach your kids to fight back against it? Uh, by the way, uh, thank you so much for showing that because Chris Eliopoulos does such a great job there. But is there any, a couple of pages maybe that you could read from that one? I am. Yeah. So yeah, I brought, I brought a couple of pages that I did want to read. And I'll tell you my favorite story in this book. Um, my favorite story in I am Anne Frank is a story, you know, that Chris drew, and it's actually one of those pages I just showed is right outside her window, she had a chestnut tree. And this chestnut tree was the only thing she could see. If she went too close to the window in the attic, then people would see her. So she had to kind of wait back and she could see this tree. And in the winter, she'd see the leaves come off. And in the summer, she in the spring, day, she'd see them bloom again. That was her Netflix. That was her YouTube watching this chestnut tree. And obviously, Anne Frank dies. Uh, they preserved the house. They worked to preserve the house. They also worked to preserve the chestnut tree, which they did until 2010 when a wind blew it over. And here's what I love, though, Dan, is that soon after that, they took all the saplings from the tree and they started planting them all over the world. And today, there are dozens of trees, Anne Frank trees, chestnut trees planted all across the globe, blooming stronger than ever. And to me, that's what the Anne Frank story is. It's it's basically you putting that seed into your kids and, and giving them, they, when you read the story of Anne Frank, she becomes a part of your kids' lives and they become a part of her life. And I'm gonna read you, this, this is my favorite part of the book. This is from I Am Anne Frank by myself and Chris Eliopoulos. And it says, in my life, there were many reasons to be sad and lonely and scared. And there were also many reasons to love and laugh and hope. You can always find light in the darkest places. That's what hope is. It's a fire within you. You decide when to light it. And when it burns bright, nothing can put it out. And then it says, and here's the key part. In the Jewish faith, there's a saying, if a person saves one life, it's as if they've saved an entire world. Throughout your life, you'll find people who need help. Be a helper. Be the one who does the right thing. When you see something that's unfair, do not be silent. Sometimes it will be hard. When it is, look up. See the beauty of the world and see the beauty in people. Now you know my story and I'm a part of yours, never forget, the world depends on it. I am Anne Frank, and I believe that people are truly good at heart. And that's obviously what it says in the back. The moral lesson is always on the back. I am Anne Frank, and I believe that people are truly good at heart. So that's uh, it's one of my favorite books we've ever worked on. And think about how those lines are adapted from the Anne Frank diary. Damn. So I can see why that was, that was harder work than usual, where you wanted to uh, reflect the truth of the story, how difficult it is for kids, the real Anne Frank house uh, in Amsterdam. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful job. Overall, if you don't mind my asking, because you know you are obviously a storyteller, that's what you enjoy. Um, you know, in my whole career of uh, you know broadcasting and writing, I've often felt that, well, to be frank, Jews, I've certainly seen among American Jews, like communicating, like telling stories. Um, do you see any link there? It's not relevant. You know, being Jewish has driven you in some way. I mean, how would you put it? Brad? I don't, you know, it's a good question. I, you know, I, I certainly believe there's something about, you know, Jewish humor that I always am like, what is that? Where does that come from? Right? Like where, where does that happen? But, I, but we definitely are storytellers and I don't want to, you know, say that there's any, there's certainly, you know, anything I can prove to, but I certainly love to tell stories. I don't know if it's, 
you know, the beautiful part of the Jewish religion is you have half of this stuff that, you know, and, and Jews also love to argue. We love arguing like nobody's business. And we argue over, you know, what it means to be Jewish. We had to deal with it in the book, right? We had a line where it said, I'm Jewish. What does that mean? And I literally put out to, you know, rabbinical friends in the Holocaust. I went, everyone that I can find said, okay, what if, I have to define for every child reading this, what it means to be Jewish. Does it mean that you're religious? Does it mean that you're funny? Does it mean you like to argue? Does it mean you like a good corned beef sandwich? Like, what does it mean to be Jewish? Um, and what we settled on, I'll read that, that one line. It says, I'm Jewish. And it says, I believe, um, and I'm going to, I don't want to mess it up. So I want to read you the exact line because it took so long to, it says, I believe in God and in helping to make the world a better place. And I like that one. That one worked well for me. I do think though, that being Jewish means you get a little bit of nature and you get a little bit of nurture. And I think that that nurture very much comes from a storytelling place. My mother was a storyteller. My father was a storyteller. My grandfather was a storyteller. And why? Because we were all sell they were all salespeople. My whole family were salespeople. And as a salesperson, you, you got to tell the story, whatever you're selling. And I, I truly believe at my core that I, I'm in a, in a, in a obviously a, a nicer background than a nicer, uh, career path. I was luckier. My parents, I was the first in my family, to, immediate family to go to a four-year college, but all I'm doing is still telling that story. Uh, that same way that, that, that was passed down to me generation to generation. Uh, and we all feel it. And folks, by the way, those of you who are watching, if you know how to ask a question by typing it into Zoom, uh, you can't. There's a comment area. And so you can you can write it because we will turn to Q&A and Suzanne will help by reading some of the questions. But just before that happens, I have one one other kind of current matter uh, for you, Brad. And I'm just wondering when you when you have a public career in our very politically divided America, are you taking care not to not to choose sides, not to be labeled liberal or conservative because it could hurt your sales, etc. I mean, how do you handle that? I feel like Almost everyone has to give that some thought. No, I, I, it's a good question. I mean, it's funny. I don't, um, I, I think of it this way. I think if you're only speaking to quote unquote your side, you're only speaking to half the country. And I don't mean that in a way of like, you know, I, I think what's important is if you're only speaking to people who agree with you, then what's the point? I think that the only way we get through is everyone has to hear what you're saying, especially those who disagree with you. And I think that if you're only listening to people who agree with you, you're not an informed citizen. I truly believe that too. I don't think either side is, oh, they've got the, the lock on what's right. Um, I have my politics, but I take my kids' books and I go on Fox News with my kids' books and I go on CNN with my kids' books. I've been on MSNBC with my kids' books. I've been on NPR and Glenn Beck. Like there are things that we do agree on as a culture, it doesn't feel like it today, especially today, right now. Um, but I, I firmly believe that the only way forward is as much as we wanna say I'm right and they're wrong and you know, trust me, I know what, what, what is right and wrong. I think the only way that we get to be better is when we stand together. I truly believe that. And there's my, my zig, right? Like I believe that if you follow someone who disagrees with you, it'll make you crazy, but you will be more informed. And I love the fact that I get to go and, and, and my friends on, you know, when we, we had a couple of our kids books that were banned. And I love the fact that I got to go on Fox news and say, listen, don't fall for these book bans. They're just scare. They're fearful tactics to scare you into voting the way they want you to vote. Go out there and actually like do your own, you know, make sure you're reading these books. Don't just be judged. Don't just be fear monger. Don't let critical race theory fear monger. you. I got to say that on Fox news. And I love the fact that they knew that when our books were banned on Rosa Parks and Dr. King, that that was a great injustice and we need to speak out against that. Um, I love the fact that I got to say that to, to a, an audience that sometimes needs to hear it in the same way that I like to go on anything else and say, when I see any extreme of any political side um, gets a little bit too crazy, I love being able to be able to go out there and be listened to. Um, and I don't mean that for sales. I mean that for like the ideas of justice and compassion and kindness in this world. If no one's listening to you, then you can't make a difference. And, and to me, that's what a good story does is it makes you be a better person. It makes you be better to other people. That's how stories make the world a better place. It's not because I get more sales, but it's because I can, you know, there was a study done that said that fictional characters affect people and the way they act more than nonfiction people do, more than real life people do. That's an incredible idea, right? That whether it's Atticus Finch or Scout or Dumbledore or wherever else, Superman, um, 
You know, to me, the most important part of the story has never been Superman. The most important part of the story is Clark Kent because we're all Clark Kent and we all know what it's like to be born and ordinary. And I love the idea of, of using whatever storytelling I have, whether it's Clark Kent and whether it's Abraham Lincoln or Anne Frank to be able to go out there and have people listen and listen to each other. That's, that's, that's my politics. Um, and I don't, I, I think going out there and saying, well, I know more than you do and you're a fool, only a fool thinks they know everything. The smartest person in the room never thinks they're the smartest person in the room. The smartest person in the room, as I've always seen over and over, is the one who realizes there's so much more to learn. Good for you. And as you say, not choosing that role for the sake of book sales, because frankly, with product like yours, Brad, they'll sell. Suzanne Borden, do you have any questions from the folks who've been watching? Sure. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Uh, it's always it's always interesting to hear where people's uh, inspiration comes from. Um, someone wanted to let you know that there is an Anne Frank tree in Seattle, um, and that they they really enjoy being able to visit and remember Anne Frank. I haven't been to the Seattle one. I would like to see that. I'm going to have to know, go there. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, uh, the, somebody wanted to know um, with every news cycle, do the wheels start turning for you? Are are you ever shut off to story ideas or you're always thinking about what you could do in the future? Yeah, no, I mean, it's funny. If you asked me that question five, six years ago, I would have said, oh, I always keep my eye on what's going on. What, what, what the country has been through over the past, you know, half a decade, I, I couldn't make up. I could, if I went into my editor and said, well, a reality TV show star is going to try and run for president, everyone's going to vote for him. And, then, and, and everything we've been through since my editor would never, ever believe that. No one, none of us would ever believe that. Um, whatever your thoughts are, you know, and whatever your politics are, you, no one could have made that story up. And I think, you know, as divided as we are today as a culture, I can't compete with reality. Uh, fiction, I, to me, I always say to people I research with, I, I can't compete with the reality that goes on. I have to be ahead of it. I have to be on where the next thing is. So when I go and speak to people at the FBI or the Secret Service, I always say, don't tell me what the problem is now. Tell me the problem that you're worried about in five, 10 years. And now that's always how I operate. But of course, I'm always like everyone else looking for those human moments, those human things that inform the books, little, little details that I'll, I'll pick up in, in the news cycle that I'll just be like, that exists. You know, there's a sonic weapon that's making people deaf when they go to Cuba and giving them brain aneurysms. Well, that sounds like a good supervillain plot or that sounds like a good bad, you know, so those things, those things feed in. But the bigger plots, I try never to compete with reality. And how did you connect with the Department of Homeland Security? Yeah, that was crazy. So um, I got a call right after 9-11 happened. The Department of Homeland Security contacted me and asked me to come in and brainstorm different ways that terrorists could attack the United States. And my first thought was, if they're calling me, we have bigger problems than anybody thinks, right? If you think the country is messed up right now, I mean, we were just, it's incredible. And um, they had seen my research and they saw the research that I do at the White House and these other places. And they, they asked me to come in and do it. So that was my entree into there. Um, and the Secret Service has helped me with books for almost 20 years now. And I, I like to you know, think that the reason they helped me is because they'll tell me, they'll say, listen, Brad, I'm going to tell you this thing. You, you, you can't write about it. You cannot write about this thing. But we're going to explain it to you so you'll understand this part, which you can write about. And for 20 years now, I've never broken my word. I'm a man of my word. And I think that's why they continue to help me book after book. But I take that trust very seriously. I always change um, the, the entryways and the security protocols. I always change those. So you'll see those secret warehouses I talked about earlier in the lightning rod that the government has, but I change the security protocols. What you see inside there is absolutely real. Um, but I take that stuff very seriously. And that's all, of course, based on the real life interactions I have there. By, by the way, Brad, I think we have a, a couple of minutes before continuing with the Q&A. Uh, fill us in uh, on that. We did, I did the story, you know, on CBS radio when you, when you found it, the flag that the firefighters had raised like Iwo Jima on the rubble of the World Trade Center in New York after 9-11, the flag was missing. And yeah, 24 hours after it went, after we saw that famous photograph of the firefighters raising it, um, the flag went missing. It wasn't a big deal at the time because it wasn't a famous flag at the time. It didn't become famous until 24 hours later when everyone saw that photo and said, oh my gosh, look at that. Yeah. And then um, 
what happened was it went missing for about a decade and I knew it was gone. And it was one of those things that I put in my files and I went to the history channel and said, I'm going to try and find it. I'm going to use a TV show, like a modern day wanted post. I'm going to tell the story of the flag and ask for people to return. I'll give them $10,000 if they return it. And that's what I did. I went on lost history on history channel. I told the story of the flag. I said, someone out there has it. If you have it, bring it back. And what I couldn't say at the time is I think it was four days after the first episode aired, a man walked into a fire station in Washington, D.C., in Washington State. I'm sorry, in Washington State, not Washington, D.C., and said, I saw the show Lost History. I have the 9-11 flag and I want to return it. And it took us a better part of a year to authenticate it. We worked with the former head of the FBI's art crimes unit and we're able to authenticate it and unveil it in the 9-11 museum where it is now. I got to unveil it on the anniversary. It's now still there on, on display. It was one of the most humbling moments of my life to play in a small role in that. Very nice. Um, any uh, more comic book projects on the horizon? And do you think there'd be an interest in showing more Jewish representation in comics? Yeah, you know, it's so funny you say that. Uh, it, Jewish representation in comics is, it, it just depends on how much you 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 want to see, right? To me, comics are built on the Jewish reputation. They are truly, you know, Superman is built by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Captain America is built by, um, you know, Joe Simon and Stan Lee and, and the Fantastic Four is Jack Kirby. I mean, all these, these people were Jews who were dealing with the immigrant experience, dealing with that early experience here in, in the United States. So I always feel like comics were always Jewish. They always tell that story, whether they and, and obviously, sometimes you can have the really Jewish experience, like having Ben Grimm, the thing in the Fantastic Four, being revealed as Jewish. They'll get a character, you know, that, that character here and there. I was just telling my son, the thing's Jewish. My, my son was like, the thing is Jewish? I'm like, I'm telling you, he is what he is. Um, so I, it's funny, when you say that, I always feel like I, I don't see how comics can be more Jewish, that they're built on, on the foundational <laughs> ideas that were brought in, in that immigrant experience. Um, but as for me, the next comics that I'm telling are all those Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman stories. And, and make no mistake, they're going to look like kids' books, but they're comics. You'll read them. Trust me, it's me writing Superman, it's me writing Batman, it's me writing Wonder Woman. Dan, were you going to say something? Uh, I, uh, of course, when it comes to the comic book world and the Jewish origins of it, sure. You know, the uh, the Zoom viewer might have been wondering, Brad, you know, if you would have a hand, for instance, in having more of those stories. And it's been from time to time also in, uh, you know, in the X-Men story uh, that, uh, you know, Magneto, you know, is a survivor of a concentration camp. So sometimes it comes, you know, into an issue. But I'm with you, actually, Brad. It's just much better when the uh, the feeling is there, right? The spirit, it doesn't have to be so Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's like that it's better or worse. It's just, I actually just, you know, someone said to me once, which of your characters are Jewish? And I remember at the time going like, oh, oh, because in my head they all were. Like, I, I, and not that I thought, oh, that's a Jew and that's a non-Jew and that's a Jew and that's a, but I just, I'm writing from my experience. So they're my sense of humor. They're my sensibility. They're my talkativeness. They have my patter. They, they, that's what they do. Um, I don't sit and go like, okay, who's Protestant here? You know, I just write what I know. And as I said earlier, that, that authentic story is, is a story you tell about yourself. So they all have, they're all imbued with what I grew up with and therefore have that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Suzanne, if I may, uh, just yeah. about television, anything coming up with you or you, you, you sort of pitch the History Channel and other channels? Yeah, from... oh, you know what, actually, here's my, oh, I forgot about this. Here's my one place where I did put Jews on purpose. I forgot this one. So we have, they took our kids' books and they built, um, we built a TV show out of it for PBS Kids. It's called Xavier Riddle and the Secret Museum. And it's about a boy named Xavier, his sister Yadina, and their best friend Brad, the most handsome cartoon character in all of existence. Um, and they have a secret museum. They have a problem. As an example, they're being bullied. They go back in time. They meet Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks teaches them how to deal with the bullies. They come back to the present day and use the lesson. Now, Brad is a character on the show. His name on the show is Brad Meltzer. He is absolutely Jewish. I, did, I will say I was tired when I was a little kid. Every Happy Days had a special Christmas episode and Laverne Shirley had a Christmas. Everyone had a Christmas episode, but there was never a Hanukkah episode until Rugrats, I remember, did it. And so we did, um, I made sure that, uh, we, we did Gold of My Year as one of the heroes on Xavier Rail, but you'll see the other, there's one day where they're coming around and they're playing and, and Brad's playing a, with a dreidel. And, I'm, and the best part was, is the kids who voice my character aren't Jewish. 
So his catch line, his catchphrase, every character has their own little catchphrase. Brad's catchphrase is oy vey. It's my single greatest accomplishment, I think, as a creator, is that I have a cartoon character whose catchphrase is oy vey. I, I'm, I feel like I've, I've earned all my Jewish points just from that alone. And, and the best part was, is the kid who played him didn't know how to say it. So I literally got on the phone in the recording studio and he's like, oy vey. I'm like, no, no, that's not how you say it. It's oy vey, like or, oy vey. But like I gave him all these oy veys. So I spent like an hour oy vey in this little kid to death, this eight-year-old boy who was learning how to say oy vey from me. So again, I think uh, that's my Hanukkah present to you all this year. <laughs> that's great. Uh, beautiful. Do your friends and family try to figure out in your various stories uh, if they're in there and who they are? They do. They do because they're totally nosy Jews, right? They're like, it's me. They're all like, it's me. My, all my high school friends, when I wrote The Tenth Justice, said that book's about us. And all my college friends said that book's about us. And all my law school friends, when it came out, said that book's about us. So I think all it really proves is I never, I never write actually my friends. Um, but I think my friends are consistent in what I like about them. I write about in that general sense. And I think, you know, I, it's, a, it's a lot of smart asses all thinking that they're really funny, which happens to be... It's all Brad. <laughs> I tell my wife all that. My wife, my wife takes all the jokes out of the books. And I'm always like, I am so much funnier than you realize. Like, you got to put all those jokes back in. I'm way funnier than you think. <laughs> uh, do you know the ending of the book before you begin it? I do. I always know. I don't know. I don't know every detail of the ending, but I always know who the bad guy is. I always know how, you know, who done it and why they did it. That I always have to know. I don't know every detail. I only plot about 50 to 100 pages at a time, but I always know the ending. I, I know who the bad guy, I know why they're, why they're doing what they do. Cause you can't, I can't do it otherwise. It's like driving and not having the address where you're going. If I have the address, I know what general directions will at least head toward. But if I don't have the address, then I'm just gonna ride in circles. Mm -hmm. um, how would you explain to kids about what's happening in Ukraine uh, and in comparison to what was happening, what happened in the Holocaust? Oh, that's a good question. Um, these are hard ones. I mean, you know, it's funny. Uh, Alexander Vindman is a dear friend of mine. And when I was actually first started talking to adults about Ukraine, I called him and asked him. Um, and my answer to that is I go and find, whenever I deal with any subject, whether it's the Holocaust, whether it's, we did, you know, Harriet Tubman and I had to do, we did slavery. I was like, I'm not making this up. I'm not the expert on this. I go and find the smartest people on that. And I ask them, tell me the ways that you've been through this. You've talked to kids about this. Tell me what works and what doesn't. So, um, but I, I, the one thing I do believe firmly in, when you're talking to the kids about the Ukraine is don't lie to them, right? Don't, don't hide the bad parts. I, and, and you don't have to be gory and you don't have to tell them, you know, but, but I think it's important to tell them what's happening there. I think it's important to tell them um, that, you know, that, you know, Vladimir Putin is saying that, you know, there's, that he's trying to root out Nazis that obviously clearly don't exist there. I think it's very important to tell kids. And I think if I could teach kids one thing today, if I can teach one class I could put in all classrooms, um, it's how to teach kids to know when they're being lied to. I think it's the biggest battle we're having right now is a battle for the truth in the culture. You can go online and find whatever truth you want to choose. There's a great headstone that I saw, a cartoon headstone, and said, I did my own research. And we can't, you know, someone says to me, well, it's not, you know, in the old days, no one gave you, you know, you know, yelled at you when, when you disagree with their opinions. And I was like, no, no, that's not the problem. The problem is not that you have your own opinion. The problem is you have your own set of facts. And when you have that, we can't communicate anymore. So I think it's important to tell kids the hard parts. I think it's important to tell kids why this is happening. I think it's important to tell kids, you know, what this country is trying to do in broad strokes, um, you know, and, and what these Ukrainians are going through. Uh, and I think oddly that part's been easier because there's so much footage I mean, those, that early footage of, of that, that mother getting on that bus, being separated from her child was one of the most heartbreaking scenes I'd ever seen. And, and you know right there what right and wrong is. And it should not be that hard to tell the difference between right and wrong. Brad, do you accept that kids these days um, are getting most of their information and entertainment in really short doses? 
the TikTok, the, the one minute item, the 40 second item? And, and if so, will there be some Brad Meltzer in, in that form to reach them? Yeah, listen, we were, I have a TikTok account. It drives my teenage daughter absolutely insane that it exists. But again, <laughs> you, you need to communicate where people are listening. I think, you know, as a, sometimes what we want to do, you know, there's a great intellectual idea that you can turn your nose up at the popular culture. You're a fool and a snob if you turn your nose up at the popular culture. The popular culture is where the world actually lives. Um, and, and if you're just communicating with your fellow intellectuals, you're missing 99% of the people. So why would you want to be there? Um, and I, I very strongly feel that, you know, I, I, there are better writers than me who have told the stories of Anne Frank or of Rosa Parks or of Dr. King. Um, what I hope that I'm good at is I can tell in a way that people will actually listen to it. And to me, that is the art form that TikTok has figured out is they've, and, and yes, we're a short attention span society and we can't go in depth with anything, but it doesn't mean you can't put great lessons and put some truth out there. And if I can do it in 30 seconds, that's an art form too. And, and I appreciate that art form. Mm -hmm. um, what was your reason for, why did you want to write a book about heroes for your kids? And, and if you could share some of who those heroes are. Yeah, you know, and, and truth was, I had kids. That was it. I had kids, and I just was looking around. My daughter was in a princess phase, and I was like, "Ugh, I need another princess toy. Like, I need a hole in the head." Uh, and and I just was like, "I I have Amelia Earhart. You know, this is going to. You know, well, how can I not give her Amelia Earhart?" And I told her at the time, I said, "You know, Amelia Earhart flew across the Atlantic Ocean." And my daughter was like, "Big deal, Dad. Everyone flies across the Atlantic Ocean." She was super not impressed. But then I told her this true story that when Amelia Earhart was seven years old, she built a homemade roller coaster in her backyard. She took a wooden crate, she put two roller skating wheels on the bottom of it, she shoved it to the roof of the tool shed, came flying down the side, flew through the air, crashed, you know, got up, yelled, whatever she yelled at the time, that was amazing. But she later said that feeling when her stomach bottomed out from under her, she wanted that feeling back again. That's the first moment Amelia Earhart ever flew. She was seven years old. When I told my daughter that story, she was like, that's a good story. And that's what the secret sauce of the Ordinary People Change the World series is, is we show you them when they're kids. You see Amelia Earhart when she's a seven-year-old girl. You see Abraham Lincoln when he's a 10-year-old boy. And yes, you'll see when they become president, when they become doing that famous thing, but we meet kids where they are. And that's why we draw them as little kids. And so kids, say, these aren't the stories of famous people. This is what we're all capable of in our very best days. And suddenly you have some, you have kids listening to these amazing stories. So I had my own kids. I knew, again, I'm not that special. If I wanted that for my kids, hopefully other parents would want it for theirs. And we have all these parents that prove that that was right. They just want to, in this divided world, give the kids a little something better to look up to. So, and just to quickly go through them. I mean, we did Abraham Lincoln, Rosa Parks, Albert Einstein, as you saw. My son loves sports. I was like, forget an overpaid athlete. Here's a real hero. Meet Jackie Robinson. I wrote, I am Jackie Robinson. Or I did, I am Lucille Ball to show my daughter that you don't have to just be thin and pretty to be a hero. Like Lucy stands for the idea it's okay to be different. We don't celebrate that anymore today. Differences, right? We look down on them. We, we classify other people as the other. But man, the best part is that we're all different. And we did, I am Helen Keller. The pages of the book go black when she goes blind. We put real Braille in the book so you can feel the dots. And it says, feel these dots. This is my name. My name's Helen. What's your name? I watched my 20 year old son with his eyes closed, feeling this book. And this is obviously, these are books for little kids, but I watched my 20 year old going, dad, this one's actually really good. And I was like, actually, I mean, actually <laughs> like that's my life in my house. But I love the fact that we've done Gandhi and Sacagawea. We've done, you know, uh, Jim Henson and, and Sonia Sotomayor. We've done uh, Muhammad Ali and Malala is our new hero. In fact, I have right here. Here's Malala, our first Muslim hero, uh, her and Muhammad Ali. I was like, I watched the way Muslims were being targeted. And if, if Anne Frank, as a book, tells you, the one part I read is it says, when you see an injustice, speak up against it, right? you got to speak up when you see it, not just when they're affecting you. When I saw Muslims get targeted, I was like, we're writing I am Muhammad Ali and I am Malala Yousafzai. And now there are all these people that have bought books about Muslims and realize, oh my gosh, their, their experience is not that far different than my experience. And the more you can link people and realize we have a shared experience, again, that's how you, that's, that's real influence. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it sounds like even though they are children's books that adults can learn a lot from them as well. Uh, lots of nice stories that no one probably knows. So thank I you. I will attempt that through, Suzanne. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we sell more of these kids' books to adults who are like, I don't want to read a 400-page biography. I let you, you pick out the good parts, Brad, so I'm just ordering it for myself. I'm like, great, whatever. We <laughs> sell more I Am Lucille Ball, I think, and Jim Henson to adults than we did to kids. That's great. I think you have some more fans today. Um, as we are about to wrap up, uh, anything new on the horizon? Any books becoming movies? Uh, what's next for you? Yeah, so um, we have obviously The Lightning Rod just came out and so did I Am Muhammad Ali and I Am Malali's size. So the, those are the two newest kids books. In next month, um, the two next kids books come out in the Ordinary People Change World Series. We're doing I Am, I Am Pei, uh, the famous architect, and we do it as a pop-up book. You, the part when he builds the Louvre, it becomes a pop-up book. And then we're also doing I Am Dolly Parton. Um, and not so a pop-up book. Not a pop-up book. I know you're going to do the joke. I know. Uh, it is not a pop-up book. But I Am Dolly Parton is a really beautiful book. And then we do Superman and Batman in September. We do John Lewis and Temple Grandin. Our first autistic hero comes out in January of next year. And the newest nonfiction book, I do a line of, nonfiction books for adults. We did the first conspiracy about the secret plot to kill George Washington that really happened. The Lincoln conspiracy about a plot to kill Lincoln, not the John Wilkes Booth plot, but a plot at the very beginning of his presidency that got foiled by America's first female private eye and the Pinkerton detectives. Um, and then we're doing in January, it's called the Nazi conspiracy about a secret plot to kill FDR, Joseph Stalin and Winston Churchill at the height of World War II. And you better believe we obviously delve into the Holocaust and you'll never, I mean, just in incredible ways. Uh, it's a triple assassination attempt. It really happened. And I do that with Josh Mensch, the, the Nazi conspiracy comes out January, 2023. So is that a book? Is that a book? or it's a, TV? it's a book. It's a nonfiction book. Uh, and it comes out here. I'll show you the cover. We just released the cover on our website and on our social media. This is the Nazi conspiracy. Well, we'll have um, to have you back at the first of the year to, to talk about that one. It's a, it's, a, it, it's a wild, true story. You will not believe it. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, uh, Brad, thank you so much for spending the hour with us. Thank you, Dan. We really appreciate it. I uh, want to remind everybody that um, Brad's current book, The Lightning Rod and I Am Anne Frank, can be uh, purchased at your local bookstores. I will be sending out a follow-up email later this week that will include a link to Brad's website. I had also put it in the chat for you earlier. Uh, and thank you again. Please sign up uh, this Thursday. We are doing a Zoominar about specialty records, and next week we we have David, Bro David Broza, as well as um, a book about uh, a play about Jan Karski that is uh, playing in DC and going worldwide. So again, thank you, everybody. We will see you next time and have a good night. Bye-bye.